In this module, we will be looking at the cells of the nervous system. Specifically, we'll be looking at neurons and the various forms and uh, shapes that exist. We will also be looking at the external anatomy of neurons as well as the internal anatomy. And we will also be looking at glial cells, which are considered the forgotten cells. And you'll learn why in a bit. Additionally, we will look at the way we uh, trace uh, these and stain these cells and discover the anatomy of such and also at neuroanatomical tracing techniques. Composing the CNS, one of the main actors, and the most important, the human brain. As you already know, this amazing three-pound uh, organ is extremely intricate and the intricacy lies in the complex network of neurons which are specialized cells that receive and transmit electrochemical signals. It is through the uh, action potential and chain reaction that of these cells uh, that fire that we are able to engage in behaviors. In this module we will be looking specifically at the neurons and how they are able to receive, conduct, and transmit electrochemical signals and we'll be looking at the different sizes and shapes. Here we can appreciate the illustration of the major external features of a typical neuron. As you can see at the top we have the soma or the body of a cell. On the outside we have these dendrites which are these branch-like processes that are responsible for receiving most of the synaptic contacts from other neurons. Once received at any of these in here, then they send the uh, impulse into the soma, and then in the cell membrane, uh, we'd find that this is what surrounds the entire cell. Inside, you can see the nucleus, which contains the 3 billion base pair code of who you are. And so in here, we could see that there may be a genotype, a particular code, a blueprint that may dictate your behavior. We do find that uh, if you are born to parents that uh, suffer from depression or anxiety, that there is a higher likelihood that the offspring would suffer from that as well. We believe that the information would come specifically from the nucleus, as that is where we have our DNA. Here, toward the end of the soma, we have the axon hillock, which is this cone-shaped region at the junction between the axon and the cell body. Uh, you will learn about the importance of this later, especially as we start talking about the action potential and the way we send uh, neurotransmitters from here down to the terminal buttons. As we go down through this uh, tunnel-like thing in here, we call this the axon, and that would be like the orangish uh, color part in here. This is a long and narrow process that basically projects from the cell body all the way down to the buttons, or also known as terminal buttons. You would have noticed in here that there is an interruption to this in here, and the what interrupts it um, is, or what protects it, better said, is myelin sheath, or the myelin. This is the fatty insulation around many axons that's made up of fat and protein, and we'll learn about what that does later. Essentially, it, uh, one of the main functions is to speed up the process. In between each myelin, uh, we have what is known as the nodes of Ranvier. This will come in handy when we get to Chapter 4 and we speak of action potentials and uh, excitatory uh, postsynaptic potentials and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. So please note that the space between myelination is called the nodes of Ranvier. Essentially, the way a neuron would work is that once the impulse was received over here, it would start a, an action potential, which would then carry an electrical signal within the cell, and eventually it would be released by the buttons. This would then release uh, the chemicals into the synapses. Uh, the synapses uh, would then connect over to the uh, dendrites here, and then we'd continue the trajectory doing the same thing we did over there. And so you here you see the, the dendrites, cell membrane here. This is the cell body as a whole. Here is the nucleus that would determine whether we respond to the stimulus or not, and then continue down the trajectory. 
In this slide, we can appreciate the major internal features of a typical neuron. Please note that, uh, again, in the nucleus, which is what we see here, uh, this contains our 3 billion base pair code, which determines how much firing of a neuron will occur. This part can be more active in people with a biological predisposition, which can start this chain reaction, so to speak, with other cells, more readily resulting in whatever symptoms we have in there, whether it again be anxiety uh, or hallucinations or any other behaviors that would be of interest. Please note that the nucleus, again, is where we have the DNA, the structure of the body. Here, these green areas here, is uh, what we have, the mitochondria. And the mitochondria is basically the sites of aerobic uh, energy release. And this is basically where there's oxygen consuming. You will find that uh, without oxygen, the cells would die. That's why it is important that uh, when we are born, that if there is any complications with the birth, that if um, the child is not extracted within a short period of time, he could be deprived of oxygen, and if uh, prolonged without oxygen, we can uh, suffer from cerebral palsy, and that would be because of brain damage and specifically cell death. This uh, complicated uh, part right here, this purple part all around with ribosomes, which are these little dots in here, this is a system of uh, membrane in the cell body that has these rough portions. The roughness is made because of the presence of ribosomes, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And, and this uh, endoplasmic reticulum plays a role in the synthesis of proteins, and basically the creation of, of proteins. Um, the smooth portions, those without the ribosomes, play a role in the synthesis of fats. And so this is essential. As you may remember, proteins also give way to behavior changes and also to tissue. The cytoplasm here is the clear uh, internal fluid of the cell. This is uh, what some people argue is what holds some of these organelles in place. The ribosomes, which are the dots, as we said here, found these are internal cellular structures on which proteins are synthesized. So the synthesis that comes from the endoplasmic reticulum, which was obtained based on the DNA code, which would then be uh, synthesized on here, and this would then make its transition out uh, elsewhere. The Golgi complex, which is this right here, the Golgi apparatus, uh, is a connected system of membranes that um, packages molecules and vesicles. And we will learn about the packaging of molecules and vesicles later as we discuss neurotransmitters such as serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. These packages, if you will, uh, they would then be shipped through these microtubules and these would rapidly send the material throughout the neurons. This uh, Golgi complex is also known as the Golgi apparatus. Uh, I prefer complex because it rhymes with FedEx and FedEx is in the business of packaging and shipping stuff and this is exactly what this uh, organelle does. It packages and it ships stuff to the terminal button. As you can see, this, slide, this particular uh, amplification, magnification of the slide comes directly from the soma of the cell. Once the microtubules go out, then they would go out through the axon hillock here. They would go through, and every so often they would hit some myelin, and then they'd reach the terminal buttons. Here at the terminal button, so you can see that we have some very similar organelles. You have a Golgi complex right here, similar to this one, which also packages stuff and ships it out. You have mitochondria, which again are also responsible for energy. And you also have these synaptic vesicles, which are, which are these little bubble-like things in here that store neurotransmitter molecules. And these are chemicals that would eventually be released um, near the synapse. Once they're uh, ready to be released, um, these vesicles would bind to the um, membrane, which would be the outer part of the cell. They'd become one, open up, and then neurotransmitters would then be released from active neurons and influence the activity of other cells.
Please note, and uh, this may be a bit premature, but please note that the release of these neurotransmitters is what brings about um, state of mind, emotions, feelings, and behaviors. Individuals who have uh, a lot of serotonin are likely, in addition to many other neurotransmitters, but uh, these are individuals who are likely to have manic episodes, and they may have uh, amazing energy, and they may feel... Um, ready to tackle any task and they feel invincible and these are all psychological processes that are made possible because of an excess amount of a neurotransmitter which would have been facilitated by the nucleus as it would have been inherited from our parents perhaps and and from there it sends its coat over here the endoplasmic reticulum determines how much protein of this is synthesized it's sent over to the Golgi complex. Golgi complex sends the message across, and now the neuron is firing in a way that's consistent with behavior that may not be uh, ideal. Individuals who suffer from depression would, on the contrary, have lower levels of serotonin, and the, in the reduced amount, the deficiency of serotonin, would then bring about a flat affect. Individuals who may feel hopeless and there'd be changes in their appetite and their mood and sleep patterns. The cell membrane, which is uh, what surrounds the soma of the body, is uh, a cell membrane that's a lipid bilayer. Uh, by lipid, we mean that there are two layers of fat molecules. Uh, lipid, you may have heard of liposuction, that's uh, where fat comes from. And then bilayer, we're talking about two. And so this bilayer, you'd have one layer here up on top, and then you'd have the other one here. These two embedded proteins are the basis of many of the cell membrane's functional properties. Some membrane proteins are channel proteins, which you can see here, and you have the signal ones over here. Please note that the signal proteins transfer signal to the inside of the neuron by binding to certain molecules that enter in here. When they bind, this then changes the uh, internal makeup of the cell, and uh, the response of the cell would then be modified. Channel proteins, on the contrary, allow for certain molecules to pass or enter the cell, thereby also changing the way the cell functions. Please keep these two proteins in mind as they will uh, serve a purpose when we start discussing neurotransmitters uh, later in future chapters. Here we can appreciate the different anatomy of different neurons. And, well, the most popular one is the multipolar neuron. That's the one you've seen with the dendrites and the soma, the axon and myelin and terminal buttons. Um, and while the majority are multipolar, Please note that there are unipolar neurons, bipolar neurons, and multipolar interneurons. Multipolar neurons are basically those that have more than two processes, which is a natural appendage or outgrowth or in an organism, such as a protuberance on a bone. Um, these basically extend from its cell body. Uh, one of the structural classifications of neurons is that a neuron from which multiple branches leave the cell body, the many dendrites of the multipolar neuron allow for extensive integration of information coming from many neurons. Uh, the axons of such neurons are usually long, which allows the integrated formation to affect distant regions of the nervous system. And this is the majority of neurons. Please note that the many dendrites of the multipolar neuron uh, and the extensive integration from many of the neurons is precisely what makes the brain very, very complex. We also have the unipolar neuron, which you can see here. And this, as you can already tell, looks different from the multipolar neuron. The unipolar neuron is one with, uh, with one process extending from its cell body. And so you can see this right here. Uh, one of the structural classifications of neurons is that a neuron from which only a single process leaves the cell body. The single process then divides uh, close to the cell body into a trunk to supply the branching dendrites for any incoming signals and 
an axon for outgoing signals. Unipolar neurons are typically sensory neurons with receptors located within the skin, joints, muscles, and internal organs. Uh, their axons are usually long and terminating in the spinal cord, while the length of the dendritic uh, trunks does vary. Please note that uh, unipolar neuron would be useful, uh, and as you already saw, they're afferent neurons, uh, sensory components. So if you're trying to take a shower and you need to determine whether it, the water is ready for you, uh, you would feel it with your hand, which would then activate a unipolar neuron because it's sense. You're sensing whether it's warm or cold or hot. That would then send a message over to the central nervous system. The nervous system would then activate motor neurons, efferent, so that you could, if ready, jump in the shower, or if not ready, then delay and regulate the water before that. Again, that's the unipolar neuron. The bipolar neuron here is one that we find in retinal and olfactory cells. You can also appreciate the difference between the unipolar, the multipolar, and the bipolar neurons here. This is a neuron with two processes extending from its cell body. So you have them going up and going down. Uh, this uh, One of the structural classifications of the neurons is that this is a neuron from which two processes leave the cell body. In this neuron, the dendritic tree, which is basically on the dendrites, emerges from one end of the cell body, while the axon emerges from the opposite end. The dendritic branching of bipolar neurons is typically limited, and the axons of such neurons are usually short in length. Please note that uh, bipolar neurons are often sensory neurons that are associated with receptor organs in the visual and auditory systems. The narrow fields created by the short dendrites of these neurons underlie the concise encoding of visual and auditory information, as we will learn in Chapter 6. And so this represents physical signals from the external world. Without this narrow encoding of sensory information, the resolution of vision and hearing would be significantly reduced. And last, we have the multipolar interneurons. Please note that the multipolar interneurons are not capable of conducting or generating action potentials. And that's what AP stands for. And, and don't worry about that for now. We'll talk about this later in Chapter 4. But uh, interneurons are neurons with a short axon or no axon at all. And the function is simply to integrate the neural activity within a single brain structure. Uh, their function is not to conduct signals from one structure to another. So they're kind of like a hub, if you will, that would connect many other neurons to each other. Though neurons are the most talked about cells of the nervous system, they're not the only cells in the nervous system. There are about as many glial cells or glia as there are neurons. Myelin sheath basically is made up of glial cells. So we'll look at these forgotten cells and see what role they play. One, these cells serve as support for neurons. In fact, it is argued by some that without glial cells we would have difficulties. Complications with glial cells uh, can result in multiple sclerosis, as you will see that glial cells mix up white matter, and that is an issue with myelination. Recent evidence for glial communication and modulatory effects of glia uh, on neuronal communication uh, indicates that uh, there may be a lot of work to do with glial cells. For the most part, a lot of research has on psychological disorders and, and neurological conditions has been focused on neurons, and we are finding uh, more and more that glial cells can, in fact, have these effects on behavior as they directly have an effect on the neuronal communication. There are four classes of glial cells that we'll be talking about, and we'll start off at the top with number one, oligodendrocytes, often referred to as the oligos by individuals or oli. Uh, oligodendrocytes are extensions in rich myelin, which create myelin sheaths. You may remember that, uh, that um, in the axon, there were these pockets of fat and protein that were responsible for the speed uh, with which the neural impulse was conducted. 
These are found, uh, these are made up of oligodendrocytes within the CNS, meaning only in the brain and spinal cord. Again, the purpose of these is to increase speed and efficiency of axonal conduction. Each oligodendrocyte provides several myelin segments, often on more than one axon. The second class of glial cells I'd like us to focus on are Schwann cells. And Schwann cells are very similar to oligodendrocytes in terms of the functions of increasing speed and efficiency of axonal conduction, but the difference is that Schwann cells are not found in the CNS. Instead, these are found in the peripheral nervous system. And so looking back at the picture we looked at in a previous module was the yellow part of the body. These uh, can, again, increase speed and efficiency of axonal conduction, but additionally, they can guide axonal regeneration. That is to say, uh, regrowth after damage. And uh, that is why effective axonal regeneration in mammalian nervous system is restricted to the PNS. Uh, when we look at reptiles, uh, they are able to regener regenerate in different parts uh, and uh, we have evidence of that through research that was done with optic nerves of frogs that were cut and that were able to regenerate in very specific and, and, and impressive fashion. We'll be talking about that in chapter 10 uh, and, and 9 a little bit more. The third uh, glial cell is astrocytes. These are the largest glial cells we have, and they get their name because of the star shape name that they have. They are the most studied, and then the reason why they're the most studied is because uh, size does play a role, and the bigger they are, the easier it is to study the cells. Astrocytes have several functions, and the one that I'd like you to focus on is on these being responsible for making up the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier, which we saw in the previous module serving as a bouncer, or the one that determined whether it impeded the passage of certain molecules or not is made up of astrocytes. We'll talk a little bit more about this in future slides. And last but not least is uh, the microglia. These uh, cells are involved in uh, the response to injury or disease by multiplying engulfing cellular debris and triggering inflammatory responses. Please note that by engulfing, we're, we're talking about sweeping over so that they could surround or cover completely. And this facilitates the uh, process of getting rid of it. Um, if you've ever gotten gum stuck in a piece of clothing, you may have heard that it'd be uh, easier to freeze that or put some ice cube onto the gum so that you could remove it shortly after as a piece. If you try doing it while it's hot, it it just gets sticky and a little messy. And so engulfing is similar to that process where you just surround or cover completely and then it would facilitate the removal of the entire piece. The inflammatory responses, which often are not nice and we don't enjoy getting swollen after perhaps contact of someone's fist with our eye, is basically nothing more than a, a healing process. The inflammatory response is a dispatch of cells and chemicals to the site um, to repair the damage. Paradoxically, the inflammatory process itself may cause the tissue damage while it is engaged in healing and, and, and repair. It's believed that inflammation may play a role in meningitis, Alzheimer's disease, and various other neurological disorders. Damaged uh, cells release chemicals including histamine and uh, others these chemicals cause blood vessels to leak fluid into the tissue, and this is what brings about the swelling. This, however, would help us isolate the foreign substance from further contact with other body tissues, and so the chemicals um, would then serve a purpose to attract white blood cells, that's what we call the phagocytes, um, that would then eat germs and dead or damaged cells. This process is what we call uh, phagocytosis, and uh, these phagocytes eventually die. Uh, pus is formed in the collection of a dead tissue, dead bacteria, and live and dead phagocytes in there. And this is the process through which you and I would heal. Microglia specifically would take care of 
any type of injury to the brain and the nervous system. Here you can appreciate the oligodendrocyte. As stated earlier, oligodendrocytes provide several myelin segments to more than one neuron often. So here you could have an oligo you see an oligodendrocyte with a nucleus and this is projecting across and providing myelin to each neuron axon. There's another one that it's providing to and yet another one here. Remember, oligodendrocytes are exclusively found in the central nervous system. Here you see Schwann cells. And Schwann cells are found in the peripheral nervous system. As similar as they are to oligodendrocytes, you could see that they're also anatomically different. Whereas the nucleus is here, and then you see the axon here, but these would be for nerves, as this would be in the peripheral nervous system. These serve to increase the speed and efficiency of axonal conduction, but as well, these can guide axonal regeneration. For decades, it was assumed that the function of glia was mainly to provide support for neurons, providing them with nutrition, clearing waste, and forming a physical matrix to hold these neural circuits together. Glia, after all, does mean glue. But this limited view of the role of glial cells has changed. We, even though it's still in its early stages, uh, it, research on the function of glia is creating considerable excitement. There is now substantial evidence that the physiological effects of glia are numerous, but the exact nature of their functions is still largely a matter of conjecture. Please note that astrocytes, the most studied of the glial cells, the ones that look like stars, have been shown to exchange chemical signals with neurons and other astrocytes to control the establishment and maintenance of synapses between neurons and to modulate neural activity and to control the blood-brain barrier. So the functions are impressive and their ability to contribute to our behavior and to the overall well-being of our brain uh, is uh, unlimited, so there's a lot of potential in researching glial cells further. Here you can uh, see some important terminology relating glial cells. Uh, please note that whenever we're talking about myelin uh, providing glia, if it's in the CNS, then we're talking about oligodendrocytes. If it's in the PNS, then we're talking about Schwann cells. When we're referring to clusters of cell bodies, uh, if talking about the CNS, we're talking about nuclei, and so we're talking about singular would be nucleus. And if we're talking about the PNS, then we're talking about ganglia, singular would be ganglion. If we're talking about bundles of axons, uh, we're talking about those long tunnels that connect the soma to the terminal buttons. If in the CNS, we're talking about tracks, and if in the PNS, we're talking about nerves. Please note that they represent the same thing, but it's just looking as to what major structural division of the nervous system they're in. As stated at the beginning of this module, if we want to understand something, we need to be able to describe it well. Understanding these cells has not been easy. A major problem in visualizing neurons is that they are so tightly packed and their axons and dendrites are so intricately intertwined that looking through a microscope that unprepared neural tissue reveals almost nothing about them. The key to the study of neuroanatomy uh, lies in preparing neural tissue in a variety of ways, each of which permits a clear view of a different aspect of uh, neural structure and then combining that knowledge obtained from each of the preparations. The first neuroanatomical technique uh, that we'll be looking at, the cell staining technique, is uh, going to provide uh, some detail but not everything. You see the number one which we call Golgi stain allows for the visualization of a silhouette of individual neurons. This is what is uh, also called the silver staining technique that was discovered by Camillo Golgi in 1873. And, and this was again used to visualize nervous tissue under light uh, microscopy. Uh, initially this was named the black reaction, or la razione nera in, in Italian. Uh, but uh, as nice as it is to be able to appreciate the silhouette of a neuron, which I'll show you a picture in a bit, um, this did not provide indication of the number of neurons in an area uh, 
or the nature of their inner structure. So Golgi stain is the first one we'll be looking at. The second is the Nissel stain. And the Nissel dyes, basically a purple dye, penetrates all cells on the slide. But this dye binds very effectively only to structures in the neuron cell bodies, meaning it, it, it binds to the dendrites and the, and, the, and the soma. But the number of cell bodies in an area uh, could then be estimated by counting a number of dots, which basically look like purple dots. This made some people question whether the silhouette that was perceived through the staining of uh, Golgi stain was real, because whereas the Golgi stain showed the, the axon, the Nissel stain did not. It just showed dots in here. The reason why this occurred is because it binds only to gray matter and it discriminates against white matter. This indicates the number of neurons in an area or nature of the inner structure. Please note that only the layers composed mainly of neuron cell bodies are densely stained. The Nissel bodies uh, show changes under various physiological conditions, and in pathological conditions they may dissolve and disappear. This is an induced response of the cell, usually triggered by exotomy, ischemia, toxicity of the cell, or any other cell exhaustion, and viruses, or, or hibernation and low vertebrates. The, neural, the neuronal recovery through the regeneration can occur sometimes after, but most often it is a precursor to what we call a, uh, apoptosis, which is the programmed cell death. Nissel stain allows us to appreciate this. The third and the final one is the electron microscopy. This is one uh, rich um, way of analyzing the cell, which provides information about the details of the neuronal structure. You see, the way this works is uh, through a color-enhanced scanning electron uh, that uh, is a micrograph of a, of a neuron cell body, and this is typically in green, studied with the terminal buttons, which would be orange. Uh, I will show you a picture in the next slide in here. And because of the nature of the light, the limit of magnification and light microscopy is about 1,500 times a level of magnification, uh, insufficient to reveal the fine anatomical de details of neurons. We could get more detail uh, by first coating thin slices of neural tissue with an electron-absorbing substance that is then uh, taken up by the different parts of the neurons to different degrees. Then it passes a beam of electrons through a tissue of a photographic film, and the result is the electron micrograph, which captures neuronal structure in exquisite detail. And so we'll show you a spectacular three-dimensional view of a scanning electron microscopy uh, in the next slide. Here you can appreciate the different colors that uh, we mentioned earlier. As you may have already guessed, here we have the various cell bodies which uh, the Nissel dye effectively binds to. It does discriminate against white matter and that's why we do not see the exon which would have been wrapped around and covered by myelin. Here we see the Golgi stain. You can see how we can appreciate the neuron uh, with its beautiful dendrites here and the axon going through. And as we mentioned earlier, the, the most exquisite picture in a three dimension here is by the electron microscopy here. You can see, as stated earlier, the green uh, body here of the, of the neuron, and this uh, allows us to, to magnify and see the cell much larger than we would see it here with more detail. Much of what is known today about connectional neuron and anatomy was discovered through the use of anterograde and retrograde tracing techniques. This is through the use of injected chemicals. That, uh, both techniques are based on the visualization of the biological processes of exonal transport. As you may already know, retrograde refers to going back. You think of the retro Jordans or the retro cell phone that I've been showing in a few of these slides. And then anterograde, speaking of forward. So anterograde is basically a tracing to where the axons project away from the area to the point of termination. 
Interrograde tracing methods are used when an investigator wants to trace the paths of axon projecting away from the cell bodies located in a particular area. The investigator then injects into the area of one, uh, one of several chemicals uh, commonly used for interrograde tracing, and these chemicals that are taken up by cell bodies and then transported forward along their axons to their terminal buttons. After a few days, the brain is removed and sliced, and the slices are then treated to reveal the locations of the injected chemical. Basically, as, as it states in here, a tracing technique. It allows us to see where it was transported to. Retrograde tracing methods are used when an investigator wants to trace the paths of, an ax of axons projecting into a particular area. The investigator injects into the area of one several chemicals commonly used for retrograde tracing chemicals. These are taken up by the terminal buttons and then transported backward along their axons to their cell bodies. After a few days, similar to the other one, the brain is removed and sliced and the slices are then treated to reveal the locations of the injected chemical. These are ways in how we understand what parts of the brain may have been active prior to the death of the animal in this case. Please note that, as stated earlier, the research in which animals are killed uh, is typically approved on the basis that the benefits would outweigh the consequences. And understanding this in here has led to the, under, to the discovery of therapeutic methods and, and preventative measures for neuropathology and various other conditions including psychological.